Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and uh, very much uh, a big fan of your work as well and, uh, and the important work of your organization. So it's, real, it's a real honor for me to be here and to tell you a little bit about our, our new research in human health impacts of micro and nanoplastics. So I will share my, my screen with you all and um, put it on presenter mode here. So hopefully you can see, uh, see my um, opening slide here and then I'll just move forward to, to the next slide uh, to tell us all you a little bit more about micro and nanoplastics. Micro and nanoplastics, as you may be aware, are very tiny plastics. And the official definition of microplastics are uh, plastic particles smaller than uh, five uh, millimeters in size, but um, we generally think about microplastics uh, as really in the micrometer range. So very, very small and nanoplastics being even smaller, generally smaller than 100 nanometers. So tiny particles that are produced by um, breaking down plastic. And as this overview shows here, nanoplastics and microplastics are very complex mixture <laughs> of solid state particles indeed, as, as Jane mentioned. And when you think about plastic particles, you have to think about a lot of different components in the plastic particle. So we have many different kinds of polymers, hundreds of different kinds of polymers. So really the building blocks of the plastics. Uh, there are many additives in, uh, added to plastics. And we just, we saw uh, from the first presentation this afternoon, you know, thousands uh, of different chemicals that are used in in plastics. There are also many sources for, uh, for micro and nanoplastics, different primary and secondary sources. I'll come back to them in a moment. There are different sizes, um, micro and nano sizes. The morphology can be very diff different as you can see here in this uh, slide at the bottom of, the, of, of my page. Different colors, um, different uh, shapes, different sizes, very complex group of, uh, of particles. They have different colors and they not only contain chemicals from the plastics themselves, they can also sorb plastic, uh, they can sorb chemicals from the environment or so-called ecotoxins as this paper referred to them. So chemicals, uh, once they make it into the environment, they can um, bind uh, other, part, uh, other chemicals in the environment like the polychlorinated biphenyls or the organochloride pesticides or metals. So a very complex group of um, of substances we're dealing with here. So where are these microplastics coming from? This, this is um, an overview from a recent report in the Netherlands, but I don't think the Netherlands is much different than many other countries. You can see here that we're talking about tons and tons of uh, plastics, microplastics, small plastic particles being produced every year. Uh, the major source of microplastics is actually the fragmentation of plastics that have ended up in our environment including food packaging, of course. Other important sources of plastics include the wear and tear of our tires, of our, of our automobile tires. There's, there are also considerate amounts being produced in, and used in paints, uh, in, in the actual production of plastic pellets. We know, of course, about the microbeads in cosmetics, but also the, the textile fibers are an important source of microplastics that are really understudied up till now. So major emissions uh, in the world and in our environment. Um, this slide here, uh, there we go. This slide here is indicating that, uh, of course, uh, food contact plastics are a major source of micro and nanoplastics. Here's an, uh, an overview of various studies uh, which show that microplastics are released from different forms of food packaging, including plastic water bottles, microwavable plastic food containers, tea bags, um, infant feeding bottles made of polypropylene um, and, and packaging and used for all sorts of food products. So there is uh, increasing evidence that uh, food packaging is a really important source of these micro and nanoplastics. So what are the effects of micro and nanoplastics? Well, this field is quite young uh, and most of the studies have been done up till now in uh, you know, in organisms in the environment. So aquatic organisms or terrestrial organisms, which we expect that the exposure will be considerable. Um, and this of course has to do with some of the first alarming reports of, of you know, the plastic soup, um, plastics being found in, in many, many marine species 
have led to, to some of the first experiments being done in environmental species. And, and so research in humans is sort of lagging behind. In any case, uh, if we look at all of the, the studies that have come out, and we're talking about thousands of studies, there have been ad adverse effects found of micro nanoplastics in over 100 species in various laboratory experiments. The thing with the laboratory experiments is that they tend to focus on one or two specific plastic types, because those are the microplastics we, we can purchase as scientists to study in our laboratories. Uh, they tend to use high exposure concentrations to first understand the hazard or you know the, the potential biological effects of the chem of the particle um, so that would that leads to actual really limited field evidence of environmentally relevant micro and nanoplastics and actually no human epidemiological studies have been done yet uh, due to many of many of the challenges in this field as i will outline them um, as i move forward in my in my talk so the adverse effects of micro nanoplastics could um, show themselves at different levels of biological organization, of course, as shown in, uh, in this figure here on, on this slide. These could be very subtle effects uh, at the molecular and cellular, cellular level uh, in gene expression or in stress responses, which could lead to sy systemic effects. Uh, changes in immune function is something we're, we're particularly concerned about when we think about human impacts of micro nanoplastics. And ultimately, changes in apical endpoints like locomotion, growth, reproduction, which could ultimately lead to population level effects. So when we, we talk about the potential effects or the impacts of micro nanoplastics in humans or in any organism, we need to consider three different types of toxicity or three different sources of potential effects. So micro nanoplastics are, are of course, particles. Uh, and as I mentioned, they're particles of various sizes and shapes and various types as well. And we know from, from studies with particles, for example, with nanoparticles or with air pollution, that particles in themselves can cause various biological effects. So we know that uh, micro nanoplastics, we, we hypothesize that they will have similar effects to some of the other more natural or anthropogenic particles where we, where we have a lot of information on. In addition to the particle toxicity, micro nanoplastics you know, contain these additives, these various chemicals, both within them and the chemicals that will sorb to them when they're in the environment. So what are the effects of chemicals in the micro nanoplastics? And another important source, potential source of biological effects in humans are the microbial effects. So micro nanoplastics in the environment will, will form a substrate for various microorganisms to grow on. Uh, and some of these microorganisms can be pathogenic. But this is a really important new field of study, which would want to answer the question, do micro and nanoplastics actually serve as vectors for pathogens, for dangerous vir viruses, even for the COVID-19 virus? And it's a really important uh, consideration when thinking about the impacts of these, of these particles. So recently, together with a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Dick Fetak from, from Deltaris in, in the Netherlands, we summarized some of the major knowledge gaps that need to be addressed to understand the impacts in humans uh, of the health, health risks, potential health risks of micro and nanoplastics. We summarized a number of knowledge gaps. So of course, we assume that the exposure to microplastics is huge, knowing the, the amount of plastics that are used and the, the number of tons of microplastics that are produced yearly. However, surprisingly, perhaps to, to, to many of you in the audience, we actually uh, do not have a very good idea of the actual internal exposure of micro nanoplastics in humans. And this is due to a number of reasons. This is because it's an extremely uh, analytical, uh, analytical challenging effort to really measure these tiny little particles within the human body. To develop these analysis methods is very challenging. Uh, you can imagine that uh, plastics are everywhere, so they will also be in the laboratories where the, the scientists are developing the analysis methods, so they will always have problems with background exposure. Uh, the particles are extremely, can be extremely small and, and difficult to differentiate from other endogenous particles in the body. 
And um, a lot of the work up that has been done up till now is focusing on some of the larger particles. And we really have a very poor idea of exposure to the nano, nano-sized plastic particles. So in, in addition to this really important knowledge gap regarding the human exposure, and this is really in order to determine the risk of nanoplastics, we really need to know what is the actual internal exposure because it's possible that we excrete as humans, we excrete most if not all of these plastics uh, and they ultimately do not form a biological risk. So it's really important to know. So we need to better understand the exposure but also how the particles are taken up, uh, where, we, where they potentially accumulate in the human body, um, if they are metabolized and, and um, excreted, so part of this ADME process. Uh, the toxicity I mentioned already, the complexity of different sources of toxicity. And we need to really develop risk assessment frameworks for this complex group of, of, um, of substances. And to do that, I think we really need to, to draw parallels with what's known already for air pollution, but also for the field of nanotechnology or nano-engineered particles, which we, for example, use in medicine to deliver drugs to humans. A lot of insights have been gained into how to, to determine the risk of these kinds of particles. So how do we do that? Well, it's, it's really a very young field and uh, the human health impacts of, of nanoparticles have not been studied in a lot of detail. And so fortunately, a number of, of large initiatives have started all over the world to better understand the human health impacts of micro and nanoplastics. So I don't have an answer to that question. All, what I have for you is some excellent initiatives and some initial preliminary uh, research. So one of the projects uh, which I have the honor of, of coordinating is called the Momentum Project. This is, this is a Dutch uh, initiative funded by our, our Dutch Science Foundation in which we have brought together a, a large consortium for a three-year project in order to, to understand these human health impacts. And the, I think the interesting thing about this project is it's a really diverse consortium of both universities and private sector organizations um, which have the goal of working together, and this includes some of the largest plastic producers, uh, working together to better understand these health impacts. So our object objectives of this project are to better understand how micro and nanoplastics are formed uh, from food packaging, for example, um, looking at different processes, different weathering processes, and to, to really generate micro and nanoplastics for testing that are more environmentally friendly, uh, ones that are really used uh, and could fill the gaps in our knowledge. A big part of this project is, is dedicated to characterizing human internal exposure. As I mentioned earlier, a very big uh, knowledge gap. Uh, we also are focusing on understanding the immunological hazards of micro and nanoplastic exposure. So we will look at uh, immune reactions to microplastic exposure in the laboratory using various human cell culture models from uh, ranging from the, the lung and the intestines to the placenta and the brain. Um, and also to look at how pathogens may actually be transported from these micro nanoplastics into the human body and if they could cause uh, immunological responses then. On the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see that uh, in addition to the fundamental research being done in this pro project, another really important part of the project is to look more at solutions. How do we assess the risks of these chemical, of these particles and the chemicals associated with them? And how do we come up with solutions? Even before we, we need to establish to, to a, a, a very detailed degree if these, if these particles are actually a risk, I think we already can move towards solutions. And so some of the companies on board are also uh, working with us to to develop this research agenda, to look at better uh, ways of recycling uh, alternative forms of plastic, but also how we can learn from uh, other fields in order to move this work forward. So one, one very short example of some of the research we're doing here in, uh, in, in this project, when, that we're extending in this project, is our research on the human fetal environment. And if microplastics actually reach the human fetal environment, do they cause harm there and are the chemicals associated with the microplastics causing harm? So for this research, um, we got together with a, a very nice group of, of scientists. I think the team science approach is absolutely necessary to tackle this question. 
Uh, we have a pediatrician working with us who is providing the placenta and amniotic fluid samples from women uh, during uh, or after their delivery of healthy babies. Those pl placenta and amniotic fluid samples are measured by chemists who have developed some very uh, innovative and state-of-the-art methods for measuring microplastics in human samples. On the other side of the spectrum, we as toxicologists study in our cell culture systems if these microplastics actually are taken up by placenta cells and could cause effects there. And together with other researchers, such as the environmental scientists who are providing us with the most environmentally friendly weathered particles, uh, and the environmental epidemiologists who are starting the first human cohort studies with micro and nanoplastics and, and health effects in children. And together with the cell biologists, we can make uh, these beautiful images such as, such as, uh, as this one here in my slide. This is a, a, a short film of human placenta cells. Um, this is a confocal imaging in which you can see these purple, purple polystyrene beads uh, within placenta cells. The yellow represents the protein in the individual cells. The blue are the nucleus of the cells. And what we can really prove with this kind of imaging is that the, the 200 nanometer nanoplastics are actually taken up by these placenta cells. So it's the first proof of concept for us that these placenta, that these particles will make it to the placenta. We know in the meantime uh, that there are two published reports of actual placenta um, accumulation of micro and nanoplastics in very small sample size. But in any case, the first results of showing in humans that uh, microplastics are found in placentas. And what our lab work is showing further is that in really important cell types within the placenta, um, these are two types of cells, uh, in particular, the, these uh, differentiated trophoblasts here in the bottom. These are the endocrine cells of the placenta. They produce the hormones that are so important for the endocrine function um, of the placenta for both the mother regulating hormones in the mother and the baby. And what the work um, of our uh, researcher in our group, Hannah Dusha, has shown is that both the 200 nanometers and the one micrometer and the 10 micrometer um, plastics are all taken up by these important cells in the placenta. And what our initial research is showing is that these, these microplastics can change both gene expression um, levels um, and change the metabolites that are formed by these placenta cells. And we hope to, to publish this, this research very soon. But the first yeah. indication... Oh. This is Dania. I'm really sorry to come Time to up. stop. Huh? Yeah. Time is against us. Okay. So if I could no ask problem. you to wrap it up, please. I will. I will. Thank you. My final, um, my final um, slide then is to show you that this placenta and early life stage effects of micro and nanoplastics are uh, being further studied in, in a large European consortium called Aurora. Um, I've, I've given here the, um, the website of Aurora. I'm very happy to be working with the Food, Plastic, Food Packaging Foundation and, and other, other groups within Europe on really looking at the early life stage health effects of micro and nanoplastics, including the, the first large scale human studies, similar to the ones that, that Carl Gustav just showed in his presentation to understand actual exposures in humans and possible human health effects. So with this, I'll thank you all, and particularly to thank Hannah Dusha for her, her research and um, look forward to telling you more about these projects as they move forward.